There are two kinds of really in this world. First is really and really. <laughs> Can you see a difference between two? First, really is curious. I want to know more. Would you tell me more? I listen. And second, really. It's really critical, uh, sarcastic, it's doubting. Do you still believe it? You think it's true? You think it still makes sense? Doubters do. We are living in a world where Christianity, Christian doctrines, Christian principles, Christian teachings do not make sense to some people anymore. So when they hear the gospel, their initial responses are this, really? Okay. We're going to start a seven-week series sermon on really, not really, not really. <laughs> and this is basically not the believers, not for the believers, but for doubters. And I want to help their understanding, our faith, does it still make sense? Is it still relevant in our day? Is it still trustworthy in our world? What it means to be Christian believers in this age of skepticism that's the main reason I wanted to start this service. And now I want to say, we welcome every doubter. Because I'm still doubting sometimes too, though I'm a pastor. And today, we're going to talk about the first topic, is Jesus the only one way, really? And now, to start with, I want to ask you one thing first, honestly, to be honestly. Do you really think Jesus is the only one way for your salvation? Don't you think it sounds like the old-fashioned in this pluralistic and diverse world? So let me ask you, why do you want to hear from pastor about this honestly, yes or no? It's very hard to answer in our day, in our world. See, what Jesus said in the Bible, John 14, Look at the screen. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What exclusive. What an arrogance. Jesus doesn't say, I am a way, a truth, a life. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I am the only life. Only through me. Go to the Father. Because we are living in a world where lots of different kinds of people are living together. Different culture, different beliefs, different faith, different religions. You go to school, go to work, go to shop, and even around your house, you are supposed to meet people different from you every day. And this is one of the most controversial and challengeable statements of Jesus to us. And we have concerns around this idea that it will offend our neighbors, it will offend our friends who have different faith from me. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't come to the church, you won't be saved and you will go to hell because the Jesus said in the Bible. Then what do you expect from their responses? They will say, isn't it too arrogant to say your religion is right and our religions are wrong? If you are honestly telling me that because we have different religious beliefs, you're going to heaven and I'm going to hell, I don't know how to have a relationship with you. They will say that and it makes sense. It's absolutely right. Therefore, before we ask, ask if the statement Jesus is the only one way is true or not, we have to ask first, do we have a right civil attitude? To the people who have difference? You know, how we treat people who have different faith from us is really, really important, not just because of tolerance. Although tolerance is a good thing, but it's not enough. You know, you can tolerate somebody and not really like them. We are called not just to tolerate human beings and our neighbors, but we are called to love our neighbors by this Jesus. So I want to have this conversation in a spirit of humility, in a, in a spirit of repentance on our religious and spiritual arrogance, judgmentalism, and unloving heart in the past. 
because these are absolutely not the way Jesus ever taught us. Okay, but now the problem is Jesus said, what the Jesus said, I am the only way to come to the Father still remains the same, bothering the people of different faith. How do we deal with this? Now to clarify what Jesus meant, we should ask this first. The only one way for what? Jesus said, is to come to the Father. Then, we should ask once more, where is the Father? Where is the Father? In heaven. Yes, Jesus was actually talking about heaven issue. I am the only one way to heaven. See, most people, as far as I know, believe there is an afterlife, even, even they are atheists, they believe there is an afterlife beyond death. And most people assume they will go to heaven. But I think most people are misunderstanding what heaven really means. Most people, I think, have kind of a cartoon picture of heaven. They think heaven is a very good thing. Heaven will be filled with whatever they like. It will be the eternal pleasure factory. So, whatever your idea of pleasure is, for example, for adults, it will be the eternal Las Vegas. You just show the first screen. Las Vegas for adults, some adults. And for kids, it will be something like eternal Disneyland. Would you show that one? Actually, when I was young, I really thought heaven would be look like Disneyland or chocolate factory <laughs> because it was the it's also the best I could imagine. Whatever your idea about it is, they love to go there when they die, even if even though they didn't believe in Jesus and even didn't believe in God and afterlife. Then what's heaven really like? Actually, it's all myth. It's all wrong. No, heaven is not that kind of place. Is there a Super Bowl in heaven? I don't know. <laughs> but I know Chicago Bulls is there. <laughs> you know that? Because it's good for me. But no, what's heaven really like? I don't want to disappoint you. But actually, heaven is where God is present. It's really a disappointment, isn't it? Therefore, the truth of heaven is not a pleasure factory, chocolate factory, but the life with God. Now, here's a clear picture of heaven. John says in Revelation 21st, this is a number one statement describing the eternal life and heaven in the Bible. And most Pastors actually share this scripture in the funeral service. Look at the screen. Now the dwelling of God is with people, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them, and He will be their God. <laughs> you see, heaven is clearly the with God life. And in the gospel, Jesus also defined about heaven one time, directly. Look at the next screen, yes. Now, this is eternal life that people may know you. That's it. People may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you send. This is eternal life, Jesus ever said. Heaven is not the pleasure factory. Heaven is where God is, and you truly become the people of God. This is heaven. Therefore, now, there's a very important thing we realize from this. Take a look at this st statement. It's very funny. If you don't want to be around God, heaven is not that kind of place you really want to go. If you don't want to be around God, heaven is not that kind of place you really enjoy because in heaven, it will be very hard to avoid God. <laughs> See? Now, we got to think about this. If you, anyone... If anyone likes gambling, if anyone likes sexual sin, enjoying inappropriate sexual relationship, if anyone likes drugs, do you think they will be happy in heaven? 
You know, sins are incompatible with heaven. Heaven is pure. Heaven is clean. Heaven is holy. Heaven is sinless. I often say in the funeral service, heaven is not that like this world filled fear, brokenness, despair, pains, loss, hatred, betrayal, and a lot of tears. But heaven is where no more fear, no more pain, no more anxiety, and no more tears. Why? Because there is no sin there. Heaven is sin-free John. Heaven is not smoke-free John. Heaven is sin-free John. And any kind of sin are incompatible with God. People sometimes pray like this. Do you mean to tell me that I go to hell because I'm not a Christian? Because I'm not a Christian, that I can't go to hell. I, I, I can't go to heaven. They will ask that. But my answer is no. You will go to hell because you are a sinner. Even if you are not Christians, I don't know. But what I know is that you go to hell because you are not, not because you are not Christian, you go to hell because you are sinners. And I am too. Because a sinner will not be able to stand heaven. Sometimes, someone put it like this. Take a look at the next screen. It's very funny. God will let everybody into heaven who can possibly stand it. Do you agree with that? God will let everybody into heaven who can possibly stand it. You get it? It's very funny, isn't it? So, as long as we want to get into the pleasure factory like heaven, there is no heaven for us. If you are still sinners, where do you better go? See, God doesn't want to push you out of heaven. God is trying to bring all of you into the heaven. God really want to see you all in heaven, all human beings he created. This is heaven. And then this leads us to our main question. Why Jesus is the only one way? And this is very simple. We said, Heaven is where God is present. The reason why Jesus is the only one way is because Jesus, he is God. If you love to with him, Jesus, in this world, you will love to be in heaven as well. Now, I want to correct a wrong idea about the way. If you are asking about the way like this, what are the minimal entrance requirements for getting into the heaven when I die? If you are seeking the minimal entrance requirements to getting into the heaven, well, I want to tell you, getting into heaven is not the kind of thing you can do. Requirements of you? Getting into heaven is not the kind of things you can do if you are trying to find the minimal entrance requirements to, for getting in. Therefore, the real question you should ask now is, how can we become the kind of people for whom heaven would be the fitting, appropriate, right, working place to us, to you and me. See, if you try to put yourself in God's place, first, you must want God and His kind of life. I like rock music. But in the heaven, there's only classic music. Oh my God, it's torturing me, isn't it? <laughs> See, you try to put yourself in God's place. What do you really want to do? What would you really want to be? If you don't want to do, be like, with God life, heaven will be torturing you. I don't like, I don't like healthy food. I like only chocolate. But there is no chocolate in heaven. How would you do there? The problem is, there's a gap, there's a gap between God and us being separated from God because of sin. The real problem is sin. As we come to understand that we cannot bridge this gap by our efforts, by our good behaviors, we cannot bridge this gap with our efforts, with our 
good behaviors. We cannot earn God's love and forgiveness by our works. It comes only by God's will. It comes only by God's grace. Salvation is given by the gift of grace of God. Only grace can bridge this gap between God and us. You know, it's interesting. The old alternative to grace in the Bible, the old alternative to grace in the Bible is talked about as salvation by works. The opposite of grace is works. Interesting. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul put it like this. Take a look at the screen. He said, If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. You know, God has given to us His grace through Jesus Christ, and He said it is the only one way. But people are still working hard to make their own salvation. We are overriding God's grace with our efforts. Do you know about the human condition? The Bible says, it says, we have a sinful nature of strong will. We have a strong will. Here's a little picture of this. Uh, I've, read a, I've read about a little girl named Shana, and she was a real strong will kid. Have you ever been around a strong will kid? Uh, when Shana was a little kid, like four years old, one of the problems was she would get on a bicycle and ride it where she wasn't allowed to ride it. And her mom got so frustrated one day, and she came out in the front yard and said, All right, Shona, look, here's a tree, and here's the edge of the drive. Here's the sidewalk. You may drive your bicycle in between tree and the sidewalk, but you cannot take it beyond these boundaries. If you take it beyond those boundaries, I will spank you. I'm going back inside the house. But we have a big picture window. I will watch you. And if you transgress these boundaries, I will come out and there will be a spanking. Shana was not intimidated by this. She backed up to her mother. She was four-year-old. She backed up to her mother, stuck her little hip out, pointed to it, and said, Well, you better spank me now because I got places to go. <laughs> you know, you get it? Sometimes we are like four-year-old kid before God. He provided the right direction called grace. But we reject that. We think we could make it ourselves by our works and our efforts. Let me ask you, how many works are enough to save you? Let me ask you, how many efforts are enough to save you? How many volunteers are enough to be saved? How many good behaviors are enough to cover your sin? How many offerings are enough to save you? How much money are enough to satisfy God? We don't know. We'll try harder, work harder, try to be nicer to the people. We'll even give more offerings. But interesting is this, no one feels that it's enough to be saved. And we'll be tired, we'll be exhausted, and it's miserable. You keep it up for several days and weeks and months, but not forever. You finally, you will be finally quit. Stop. And it'll make you feel guilty again. And after enough guilt, you will start doing something else again. And you will be trapped in this miserable cycle. Would you see this one? You will try harder, and you will tire and you will quit, and you will feel guilty. And you will try harder again. Tired, quit, guilty. Try harder, tired, quit, guilty. The same apostle Paul ever said in Romans chapter 7 in his struggling with sin cycle like this. Would you, would you show us next screen? <laughs> he said, What a wretch man I am. What a wretch man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Do you see such a pain of a man named Saint Apostle Paul being trapped in the miserable, sinful cycle of human efforts? But the real amazing is this. In the very next verse, Paul said, take a look at the next screen. Thanks be to God 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a wretch man I am. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. He ended up finding the right of grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, shining above all. He is God. But he came down to the world and he was crucified on the cross for my sins and for your sins. On the cross, he was taking on himself all the pride. He was taking on himself all the selfishness, all the hate, all the darkness inside me, inside you. He was paying the debt I could never pay to God and all the wrath and all the judgment of God on my sin that all to follow me fell on Jesus on the cross. Jesus was expressing God's willingness to forgive us on the cross in that way. How could I not say he is the only one way? to come to the Father. How much money is enough to save you? How much good efforts, good behaviors are enough to save you? Let me ask you again. How much grace is enough to save you? How much grace is enough to save me? Bible says, Jesus much. Jesus much. Because he is God. In our day, in our world, the Jesus world, I am the only way and the truth and the life sounds like old fashioned. People outside of the church challenge us saying like this. Take a look at the next screen. They will say these three ways. All religions are basically the same. Second, Christianity is simply one philosophy among many. Christians are narrow-minded, thinking their teacher is the only one way to heaven. And they say, there are many paths to God, and all paths lead to God. And this is very popular and powerful in our day. They use the metaphor of God sitting on the top of a mountain, and we all climb the mountaintop to get to God, taking different paths, different roads. There's God on the mountain, and Buddhists take this way, and Muslims take this way, Christians this way, and Jewish people this way, and we all wind up meeting on the top, and we will get to the same God one day. Eventually, everything was same. All our faith, all our, all our faith, are wind up being same. Therefore, all religious paths ultimately lead up to the same top of the mountain, to the same God. And surprisingly, even a surprising number of Christians have been caught up into believing this notion that all paths lead to God, as long as you sincerely follow your chosen path. As long as you're doing good works, doing good behaviors, we will get to the same God one day. Is there anyone in this room who have children who have this faith? Is there any members who are still doubting about this? Is there anyone in this room who have friends who have this kind of notion? All are same, all are same. But the Bible says, you don't have to climb to the mountaintop with your effort to get to God. The Bible says in the Bible, the Bible said, God says, I will come down mountain in Jesus. He took up the body, the physical human body in Jesus, and he came down the mountain to meet you. Because God made only way to meet you, I have to come down because you cannot come up. How much good works is enough to save you? 
It's enough to climb up to the mountain. How many works, how many efforts, how many behaviors, how much money? If I'm a poor, I don't have money, I cannot be saved? How much money do you have? You are rich, then how much money? Hundred thousand dollars? Million dollars? Is, is, is it enough to save, satisfy God, make God happy? No, God found only way I have to come down to meet you. You know, you don't come to God. God came to you first. And we call this grace. I'm going to wrap up. I come up with nothing alternative to Jesus at this point. Nothing but Jesus, what he has done for us on the cross. Today, we need this grace. And that's why I believe Jesus Christ is the only one way, only one truth, only one life. But I'm not saying now I'm going to exclude other religions, people who have different faith. We have to get out of narrow-minded Christians, narrow-minded attitude to others. We have to pray, help us, O oh God, run from anybody of any other religion. Let us have loving hearts to embrace and honor and serve people of other faith like you have done on earth 2,000 years ago. We have to ask that. Yesterday, Vivian asked me, how do we deal with these people? I said, is difference is wrong? Difference is wrong? No. Difference is good. I have my faith. I have my faith. You have to say your faith before anybody else. And then you will have Jesus Christ on the cross. And you have to say, I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus said, this is true, I believe. That's why I'm here. Let us pray. Is Jesus the only one way? Really? Oh God, I want to say yes. Because I find myself that I can't overcome my sin by myself. We realize that we need someone more powerful and wiser than us to save us. And if you really did, if you are willing, oh God, I want to accept you. I want to receive your forgiveness and your love, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. You came down the mountain to meet me as a free gift of grace. Oh God, I want to surrender this time. I want to surrender. And oh God, help our narrow-minded attitude to others. Help us run from anybody of any other religion. Let us have having loving hearts to embrace, honor, and respect, and serve people of other faiths. Because you have done that way. You lived that way 2,000 years ago when you were one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.